Welcome everybody. Thanks for joining us. This session is being recorded. Good afternoon and welcome everybody. Uh, I'm Tony Lemieux. I'm founding co-director of the Atlanta Global Studies Center. Um, and I'd like to welcome you to this event, uh, USAID Opportunities for Faculty and Graduate Student Researchers under the Research Technical Assistance Center. Um, I'd love to introduce my colleague and co-director of the Atlanta Global Studies Center, who's at Georgia Tech, uh, Anna Stenport, to tell us a little bit about the center and introduce herself, and then we'll uh, introduce our speakers and get the program going. Hello, everybody. Good afternoon. Thank you, Tony. Thank you, Diana Ren Rapp, um, who is uh, DJing and uh, monitoring and uh, organizing behind the scenes, and also Shebnam Oskan at uh, Georgia Tech for um, for all for your work on putting together this amazing symposium program. The uh, Atlantic Global Studies Center was founded in 2018 thanks to a US Department of Education Title VI National Resource Center grant. And our mission is to bring the higher education community in the Atlanta region together, convening, collaborating, championing, communicating about the region's strengths in uh, global education, international studies, advanced language learning, and so forth. Um, to and also to support um, private sector, uh, public sector uh, entities, nonprofits, and so forth in in uh, expanding connections that really leverage the region's global um, orientation and um, and recognizing that higher education and collaborating also with K to twelve is a um, a very important uh, component of that um, of that ecosystem. Our work is organized around advancing the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, and uh, we're uh, uh, really uh, thrilled, uh, Tony and I, to to have you as AID um, as part of the program, and uh, look forward to uh, learning more about how we can uh, strengthen our our burgeoning partnership. Thank you. Thanks, Anna. And so, just a quick couple of housekeeping items. Um, the session's recorded, so please uh, mute your microphones unless you're you're speaking. And we'll have a, a, a presentation um, and some time for question and answer um, about how to participate uh, in the network. And you can also uh, use the chat function. So please feel free to type questions in real time um, or raise your hand, and we can uh, introduce our speakers. And I think um, you know we've got a great agenda today. So. Let me just quickly introduce, so uh, Gabriela Alcaraz is a researcher with more than 10 years of experience conducting, supporting, and coordinating quantitative and qualitative research in diverse settings, the topics of food security, agriculture markets, market-based humanitarian food assistance, gender inequality, and poverty reduction. Um, she has, since 2018, served as the Research and Technical Assistance Center Research Director and oversees uh, implementation of different research related activities. Um, prior to this role, she served as senior market and trade analyst for the USAID Famine Early Warning System Network. Um, she has a doctorate in agricultural economics and social sciences, and really is all about interdisciplinarity and bringing non-researchers closer to research. Uh, so thank you for joining us today, Gabriela. Uh, Sutherland Miller uh, III has extensive experience in international development and program design and management. He's worked with multiple donors, clients, uh, and U.S. and foreign agencies. His expertise is in trade and investment policy and promotion, uh, enabling environment policy reform and competitiveness, knowledge management and organizational learning, among other things. He presently serves as the project director um, and chief of party of the Research Technical Assistance Center, uh, a five-year, $24 million project designed to leverage the academic community to provide evidence-based research and technical assistance for the U.S. Agency for International Development. So um, Sutherland has a, an extensive record of, of overseas assignments, completing assignments in over it says 42 countries and territories in his bio. And so really uh, incredibly uh, um, fortunate for having Sutherland with us today. And we're welcome uh, also to Takora Jones. Uh, Dr. Jones is the acting director for innovation and technology and research hub in the deputy for research and innovation technology and research hub of the US uh, Agency for International Development. There she manages research and development programs for the agency 
that build bridges between development professionals, universities, all with a multidisciplinary lens. Um, beginning in 2009, she uh, was really active in diplomacy, security, and development as a fellow. Um, and I think uh, really, again, invaluable perspective and experience. So Dr. Jones is going to start with an introduction to the Innovation Technology and Research Hub um, and representative of one of the ways that USAID partners with higher education and research. Um, Dr. Jones can't stay with us for the whole session today, so she'll give some uh, introductory uh, remarks and have a little bit of time for question while she's still here, and then we'll move on to the remainder of the program. So with that, I'd love to uh, turn it over to Dr. Takora Jones. Thank you so much, Tony. Good afternoon, everyone, or good evening, or good morning, depending on where you might be calling from. As Tony said, my name is Takora Jones, and I'm the Acting Director for the Innovation Technology and Research Hub, which is part of the Bureau for Democracy, Development, and Innovation within USAID. All of this is a mouthful. All of it is actually rather new as the reorganization from um, where we used to sit as the US Global Development Lab, which is something you may have heard from, into the Bureau for Democracy, Development and, and Innovation took place in November of 2020. So at this present time, um, that move was to more formally institutionalize approaches to innovation um, te technology, particularly as it relates to digital development, digital financial inclusion, digital systems and services, as well as research in a more agnostic and um, um, agnostic to sector and region kind of way, moving more of those approaches into a bigger portion of the agency to really help these uh, approaches take hold. At this point, um, the organization that I sit within as I said, used to be the Global Development Lab. And prior to that was the Office of Science and Technology. So if any of you have been followers of USAID, either through grant solicitations that we put out or other reports that you may have seen, um, I started the Higher Education Solutions Network in 2012 as one of the ways for us to more effectively re-engage with the higher education community as it sought to engage international development. Now, this was in part because now that the agency had disengaged from, edu from higher education institutions, it's more that we had gotten very sectorally focused and very specific in how those engagements had previously taken place. And what we sought to do was find ways to work at the intersections. So really around that time, social entrepreneurship, ways of using um, computing technology differently, ways of thinking differently about human-centered design and engaging those types of approaches within global development were part of what we were looking to do. In addition, because the problems of the world are so much more complex and that the multidisciplinary approaches that we take require so many different kinds of partners and so many different kinds of skill sets, we wanted to be able to access that through the work that we do. In my role as a deputy for research, in addition to the Research and Technical Assistance Center program that Sutherland and Gabriella are going to talk about, and thank you all so much for that, um, there's also the Long-Term Assistance Services for Research Program, or LASER, which is housed out of Purdue University, as well as the Partnership for Enhanced Engagement in Research, or the PEER program, which is run by the National Academies of Science. And each of these opportunities is yet another space where we are engaging either researchers, research organizations, and how they participate in global development. Because what we know is that, you know, when you think about research, you think about the products of research, and typically the things that will get you tenure if you are operating within a kind of a more traditional environment are publications and patents. Well, in global development, those are not necessarily things that will get you impact. They may get you kind of attention, but being able to move beyond the publication, beyond the patent, and into a space where you are actually working with communities or with governments or with other entities that are impacting the broader world that we live in requires so much more. And we are so pleased to be able to partner with the Research and Technical Assistance Center to help make that transition and, and bridge that gap. One of the examples that I'll give is of some work that we've done, of that bridging is of some work that we've done with the cash fund with um, the University of California at Berkeley in the Development Impact Lab. 
They, for example, have been working on um, benchmarking cash interventions and cash transfers against traditional development interventions. And that kind of research requires a certain level of partnership in part with the missions that we serve in, with the communities that we work with, and then comparing and contrasting across a number of different interventions to see if that's actually an intervention that we as an agency would choose to take on. But of course, if that research is only being done in a single sector by a single entity, how can you be transformational when you're not necessarily operating in a way that you can crowd more people in? So when we are seeking to bridge the gap between research and use, it really is about creating more communities that are more inclusive, uh, creating different kinds of tools that allow for that translation of research and creating opportunities for researchers to be able to participate in global development in partnership with development professionals. So with that, I will close my remarks, answer one or two questions, because I have a small child that has to be dealt with. I have to run and get her. But um, I thank you so much for your time. I'm hoping that the time that you all are spending together will be productive. Thank you. Thank you so much, Decora. Do, do we have uh, a, a couple of quick questions from the uh, audience here? Well, if not, I have one ready to go. Yes, I have one ready to, and it, it's a thank you so much. It uh, speaks to uh, what you mentioned about um, the, the lab at Berkeley. So I asked uh, one of your colleagues this question informally earlier. If you're seeing um, any good sort of model partnerships that uh, that are evolving, uh, where you're noticing some really you know best practices for working with higher education, and especially, especially in the sort of interdisciplinary space um, that uh, that you could share with us, that'd be incredibly helpful. Yes, I think, you know, some of our biggest challenges is that the way that we are, um, as, as a PhD holder myself, the way that we are educated is to become experts and in, within our own field and to very kind of get, get very specific and have our own kind of jargon and language. And I think one of the biggest challenges for people to work in a multidisciplinary fashion is to find ways to make sure they're all having the same conversation and using the same language. When you add development professionals to that mix, it gets even more complicated. And so in terms of best practices, really making sure people are taking the time it takes to get to the space where everyone actually knows what we are dealing with, why, who are our stakeholders, how will we communicate, you know, those process pieces as well as kind of the language and jargon that people might use, like getting to a place where everyone actually understands what's going on. Um, because it's very easy for people to get excited about the research without fully appreciating what the possible implications of that research might be, how it might be received, how it might be engaged, and being able to take the time to think through the bigger picture is always of value. When I talk about the cash benchmarking work in particular, it took nearly a year to negotiate that scope. And I know that people are like, but time. Well, yes, but that's either time that you spend on the front or time that you spend on the back. So which would you prefer? Would you, would you prefer to spend more time in design and getting to the place where everyone has, has negotiated out roles and processes and Kind of if you're working on monitoring and evaluation, all of those things up front? Or do you want to get to the end and realize that you have a mess and you have to figure out how to actually message it to somebody? My preference is that you do it on the front because it's easier to communicate to someone like me <laughs> who may be operating in a space versus like, okay, well, we've got 15 minutes to talk about this because I have to go make decisions about it. And if you haven't figured out how the results of your work are possibly impactful to the work that I may be designing, then you've wasted your 15 minutes. And, and I think that it, we often in, in more kind of academic circles, we, we get comfortable in the very long conversations. And I miss those sometimes, but the world is ridiculous and moves very, very fast. And we have a new political administration that is still very much in the process of coming in, is very excited about the work that's going on within the agency, but you know, we, we have to catch them in the right space. And if we are too busy kind of going through all of the many ways that we can talk to people instead of meeting them where they are, 
you've lost some time. So great, you know, great point. And I think one of the things as you were talking to Cora, just, uh, you know, dawned on me is like some of the approaches like, you know, and I wonder to the extent like things like design thinking or some of those sort of practices help in that sort of bringing people into that space and really getting people to sort of speak about the same things in understandable ways, which is a big challenge of interdisciplinary. Mm -hmm. are, there, are, are there some of those processes that, that are more promising than others in this? You know, I don't, it, all processes can be people and, and moment dependent, but the human centered design approaches I think have been valuable because it's just like, wait, is this an elephant <laughs> is yeah. the question <laughs> that everyone is trying to like, is it an elephant? Am I touching the tail of the elephant? Am I touching the nose of the elephant? What does this do? You know, really taking the time to unpack what you are doing, why you are doing it and how all of the pieces are connected. And it's never going to be perfect. That's part of the human experience. It's never going to be perfect, but at least knowing that you have processes that learn and adapt and are iterative is also part of that as well. Great. Are there okay. any other question? Any other I, I think this is probably, we're, we're cutting into your, into your time right now, but I do Commute want, time. Yeah. <laughs> But thank you All so right. much for joining us today. And uh, we thank do hope you. to continue the conversation. Great. I hope you all have a fantastic conversation and be well and be safe. Give yourselves grace. Take care. Thank you. All right. Um, well, thank you for that. <clears throat> so our objectives here today are to describe this project, which <clears throat> Uh, is somewhat unique in, in terms of the way USAID operates and how it directly engages with the academic community, both in the US and abroad. So over the next few minutes, we'll talk a little bit about um, the project in terms of the range of activities that we undertake that support USAID's development agenda, the types of expertise that we are looking for within the academic community and also among our development partners. Um, a profile of the existing research network to give you a sense of what types of um, skill sets are in there, what types of demographics are in there, where they come from, uh, university affili affiliations, and how, um, in more detail on how faculty and other university fellow researchers can participate in the activities that we do. So we can go to the next slide. Just to give you a sense of where we are, um, as Decorah mentioned, we're um, a USAID-funded project. Um, we're at about our midpoint. We started in 2018. The core of the project is this research network, which at this stage is about almost four times what it was when we started in 2018, over 940 individual uh, academic researchers. Um, and they are located in more than 70 countries. I think we're up to 75 now. Um, we do a, a, a variety of different things, research, research translation, training, policy convenings, and short-term technical assistance. We'll give you a couple examples of some of that, which it kind of varies. It's on, it's demand-driven work. So an individual mission or a bureau or an office within USAID will ask if this mechanism can help them do a specific type of tailored technical assistance. We do, our activities are both in the US and abroad. Clearly COVID has had an impact on whether we're literally abroad or engaged virtually, um, but we are meant to be operating both in the US and overseas. Next one. Our consortium, um, 16 partners, NORC at the University of Chicago is the lead partner, uh, manager of the activity. Um, just to note that we have um, several university partners, uh, both in the US and abroad. And we have some specialized research um, uh, development partners. I'm gonna talk mostly about our technical work. There are two, three other activities that we do, which are not really referenced in this presentation because they're implemented 
by NORC itself or certain specialized development partners. Those include activities like building the research network and engaging with them uh, in partnership with us and maintaining uh, our website. Um, okay, we'll go to the next one. So just the, the basics of the project, again, we run through uh, uh, 2023. Um, Decora gave you a little background on DDI, uh, which is one of the new USAID uh, entities, bureaus uh, of 17 within USAID. Uh, and unlike a regional bureau, say the Africa Bureau or something like that, the work that they do is cross-cutting across various um, technical areas that USAID does, as well as engagement with various other parts of the agency. Um, and there's a mission statement, which I won't repeat because I think Decora covered this quite adequately. Um, but essentially, you know, to focus on innovation research and how we can apply research to have better development outcomes, including scaling up, application of research, engaging stakeholders to actually turn, you know, a specific research related activity into some form of policy advice or action. Next slide. So again, we'll talk a little bit about, give you some examples of the types of, of things we do in terms of topics, as well as the partnerships that we form to implement these activities. So research studies, research to action plans. So working with a, a USA funded research team to help them walk through a process of engaging stakeholders and get to the next step of their research, whether that's getting more funding, whether that's um, engaging a policy audience, or um, implementing um, results of their research. Research translation communication products is similar. Um, sometimes how do we communicate you know, five years of finding results in a way that's compelling for a policy audience or a stakeholder audience that you may want to engage in to have a more direct impact. Policy convenings, and again, that's also something we've done some of with the COVID um, situation that really has changed our ability to do some of these things a little bit and technical trainings. And then the last bit is for this on-demand technical assistance for uh, uh, a USAID entity that, that's interested in getting some support in some of these things. And we'll go through some examples of what that looks like as well. So, this is just to show some of our research activities to give you a sense again of the technical areas we work in, uh, the regional focus that we work in, as well as our university par partners. So uh, a political economy analysis on wildlife trafficking, we did early on with Duke University as the main implementing partner, um, is focused on the Mekong Delta region. Um, business, uh, a small and growing business segmentation studies and economic growth activity with one of our African partners and um, a mixed team of some of their partners uh, doing research. Um, uh, so Makarara University is one of our partners based in Uganda. Um, one of the types of things USAID also wants to do is sometimes veers on an internal assessment of a program. So with the University of Alaska, we did an assessment of one of their fellowship programs. Um, and another study we did with Columbia University and a mixed team um, on regulatory, regulatory technology for financial inclusion in Honduras. And this is one where USA was trying to figure out if an existing model of what they did was having impact. We'll go to the next one, a couple more examples. Um, I'll go through these quickly. You sort of can see the types of partnerships that we're doing. Um, agriculture is still a very important area for USAID, so food security. Um, we've done a couple of interesting things. University of Notre Dame is one of our fixed university partners, and they've implemented some of our studies. This was on um, resilience for, for refugee camps uh, in Kenya. Research translation um, in South and Southeast Asia. Uh, again, more economic growth things. Also again with Notre Dame. 
Um, we've done a couple things in Haiti on um, mostly food security. And then we also did another one, again, for USAID itself. How does USAID engage in historically Black universities? So that's some examples of our research, and Gabriella can expand on some of the mechanics behind these as uh, she takes over. Next slide. Uh, research action plans. Again, this is a mix of different sectors in different countries. So this is where we help uh, a previously funded research, USAID funded research team to look at their research and try to uh, build on their uh, the impact. So we did a land reform piece in the Democratic Republic of Congo, um, scaling up an, uh, an approach toward kangaroo mother care in Indonesia, um, uh, another health intervention in Tunisia, um, another health inter uh, intervention related to tuberculosis in the Philippines, um, an energy efficiency storage uh, approach in India, and looking at uh, various techniques to uh, reduce organic uh, pollutants in the Philippines. Next slide. Communications products, and some of these can be related to one of the research action plans. So that's also a mix. Uh, we've worked with teams in Colombia, Cameroon, DRC, Morocco, Tunisia, the Philippines, and Mali. And these products are also designed, again, with a focus on the end user. So in a couple of cases, these are more like training uh, activities for stakeholder groups, such as farmers in Cameroon, or more for a specific policy audience, like the, uh, the piece on uh, deforestation in Colombia, which was designed to try to engage the national parliament in enacting stricter regulations. Next slide. Some of the convenings, these are just three of the policy types of things we do. And a note to the academics, generally, these are also another way for um, researchers to engage. We typically, the model we have typically involves panel presentations, brief conference papers, things of that nature. So this is another way that we reach into the network to try to find participation to help um, lead us through various aspects of a topical thing. These events tend to be one to two days. Um, so there are a multitude of different people involved in helping us with these activities that we do. I think one more. Technical trainings, we've done two of these. Again, COVID has had an impact on this. And these, um, one was done by one of our partners, the Population Reference Bureau with us, the other one by Arizona State University. Um, like I'm sure you are all familiar, some of these things, uh, you know, what used to be uh, thought of as an in-person cadre of 20, 25 trainees. Now we're having to shift all these things to be a virtual format. In some cases, USA has asked us, like with the ASU presentation, to make it a global open public presentation, um, highlighting USA's research through RTAC for a public audience. Let's go to the next. Okay, I'll ask Gabriella to take over from me now, and she's going to talk a little bit about the profile of the network. Um, again, both in terms of expertise, where they come from, demographics, and then also lead us through um, the nitty gritty of how people can engage with us. Gabriella? Yes, thank you, Sutherland. Um, yeah, as, as Sutherland mentioned, I will start talking about the research network. So, um, as it was noted in the introductory slide, we have about 940 uh, researchers registered with us. Um, you will need to go to our website, we will show later, and there's a, a function for you to join the network. Oh, the eligibility cr criteria is that you are affiliated to an institution of higher education. So we are following uh, the USA technical areas. You can read them there. Um, at the time of the start of the project, we had nine technical areas. It has changed a little bit in recent past, uh, but practically they refer to these main topics. 
So when you register to work with us, you have to indicate your uh, expertise uh, in the technical areas, of course, but also in which countries have you worked or if you are working more at the global space. Um, and we, our network members uh, represent students, graduate students, uh, faculty, like very senior, not so senior. So everybody's welcome. There's a space for everybody. Uh, ARTAC has a, a strong mandate also in capacity building. So we organize activities for our network members to develop certain skills, uh, particularly as it relates to research translation. As, as Tadalan was mentioning, how to communicate research in a way that um, helps better decision making by relevant stakeholders. So we also prioritize areas where USAID has a presence. So you can see in the map to the right, those are the countries where USAID has um, activities. Um, next slide, please. So you will have to indicate also, I mean, it's ideally if you have some experience in these countries. So going to our network members, um, we have about 40% are women. Um, about half of the network are based in, in developing countries. Um, about a fourth of the US-based um, researchers are belonging to a minority serving institution. We are very engaged and committed to diversity and to find the expertise where it might be. So we try to expand our outreach to all type of institutions. And as Sutherland mentioned at the beginning, we have researchers in about 75 countries and growing. Um, so in total, we have about 430 institutions represented. So we don't have that many people in each, in, in each institution, but we have a contact. So that's how the network works. Like once someone from one institution is there, it's very easy to make an outreach to different areas of expertise if we want to work in, in a particular country. So the network uh, is very malleable depending on USAID needs, and we can expand it as, as needed based on the activities. Next one, please. So how to join our network? Um, as I mentioned, you can visit our website and the, email, the URL is there. And you basically have to, to submit an application. I talk about that. So once, you, once we receive your application, um, the, the platform is managed by our partner IIE, the Institute for International Education. They also manage, if you know a little bit about that, they also manage the applications and the Fulbright program. So they do have vast experience in managing this type of vast networks. So the, your application will be reviewed and that's mainly to ver verify that you are registered to an university and that you uh, completed all the information that we will need to contact you. Um, about five business days later, we will uh, accept your application and then you will become part of the network you will usually receive notifications from me or from someone else in, in the team to alert you about new opportunities or new activities that we are having. Next one, please. So going to the interesting part, like how do you work with us? Well, when, when you become a member of the Art and Network, um, USAID, uh, usually they're working on different scopes of work. We have different type of activities, as Sutherland mentioned. So once this scope of work is shared with us, then practically we share the opportunity with our ARTAC network members. So you will have to indicate the preferred email address. Some people prefer to use their institutional email address or the personal email address. You have to be careful with that because that's where you will start receiving that. So you will have to monitor carefully your email addresses because we have a very short timeline. So one of uh, ARTAC was created as a mechanism for quick uh, turnaround, like very quick response. So we have, let's say we have two types of activities, the simple opportunities and the comp complex opportunities. Simple opportunities will be the type of activity which an individual can carry it alone. For example, some data analysis or a literature review or some very specific technical assistance where, um, yeah, that you, you wouldn't require the combination of too many persons working together. So the time for submitting a proposal is very short for this type of simple opportunities is one week. We have standard templates that they are provided when an opportunity is released, but I mean, you, have, you have to be quick in, in, in assembling something and, and submitting back to us. And if we're talking about a complex opportunity, this is 
type of activities that require teamwork. Uh, we have had teams going from two persons to 14 persons located in different countries. Uh, they are just complex activities. They may require field work, they may uh, require a combination of methodologies, and as I mentioned, different geographic spaces. So those opportunities, we have a two week turnaround time. So once the proposals um, are finished, they're submitted to us, to ARTAC, in this case me, and um, there's, there's a review panel which assesses the proposals and um, organizes the information to be submitted to USAID. And ultimately it's the USAID team, the ones that uh, makes a selection of which is the implementing team that seems to fit better their interests. Uh, once the selection is done, uh, we work to onboard the selected team uh, or researcher, and this can vary. There's many, uh, let, let's say there's many bumps in the process because if we're working with individuals, some may be able to work as, indiv as individual consultants, so the activity may start quickly, but when there's some more complex activities, we have to, of course, go through a more like institutional subcontracting, and those may take longer. And uh, let's say the research team is just waiting until the process is, is completed. Um, it may take time depending on, on the institution and the policies that they have, but once we go through that uh, process, you are ready to start the activity. So the, the tricky part here, as I mentioned, is just how, how short is the turnaround time for proposals, but um, as I said, there's templates, there's some guidance provided for that. And of course, there's always someone ready to answer questions if you, if you need to. Um, next slide, please. And linking a little bit to what Tikora was mentioning in her, in her intervention earlier, is like, what are we looking in this type of, of activities? Um, there are short turnaround time activities as well. There are, I would say, few months, uh, we have a couple that have been longer, one year, we have one that is two years, but in the rule, they're like very short, very specific, uh, very concrete type of activities. The whole implementation requires a high level of collaboration and engagement with the USA team. Um, if you are not familiar with the term of co-creation, um, that's what happens. You submit a proposal, but that becomes like a shared project. So the USA team will provide feedback, will contribute to the methodology, will provide suggestions, will offer contact. So it becomes a, a very a close interaction, which of course can be also, um, if, you, if you are a researcher that is only interested in the methodology, let's say it might be a little bit distracting, but practically that's how, that's how we ensure, and USAID of course, and other stakeholders uh, ensure that the research is relevant to their needs. So that's a very important process that uh, if you aim to work with ARTAC, you should be prepared to, to go through that because that's, that's what will generate impact of your, of your activity. We also have multiple deliverables usually. Um, there's gonna be presentations, there are gonna be reports, technical reports or other type of products as, as Sutherland mentioned earlier. And most often they are implemented by a team. Um, Few of the activities that we have had so far have been implemented by individuals, but in, in principle, we're always working with two or more people. Like I would say in average, we're working with teams of four, four or five. And as I mentioned, the, the methods there will be a mix of methods. Uh, as Tikora mentioned, sometimes it, it doesn't need to be perfect. It just needs to be right on, on spot. Um, a mix of primary and secondary data, um, there are small and targeted studies, so very often we will not be looking to nationally representative samples and very big picture statements. We will be looking to understand a particular problem and provide a concrete solution or recommendation to it. So we rely on information on the ground. They are very often our research projects are forward looking because they're going to support programming decisions, as Tikora mentioned, like tell me something that I can use. Um, it's, it's very, very, for, for many researchers, this is a little bit of a, a different approach because many researchers tend to look back to the theory and now what the literature tells us, but I mean, this is useful that shapes and, and brings the background, but from there on, practically you need to see, okay, how do we solve the problem now with the information we have now and how things will move into the future. So they, they have this forward looking, um, interest embedded in the research questions. 
And often, even if it's not very evident from the technical sectors that I mentioned at, at the beginning, uh, the U USA technical section, sectors, sorry, um, they do use specialized tools. So even if you have like a background in computer science or like machine learning, artificial intelligence, uh, heavy econometrics or statistics forecasting, those are very welcome skills. So, and also like more in the social science space, political economy analysis, um, stakeholder mapping, um, yeah, anthropology, cultural studies are also relevant in some of our projects. So, you will you will find space applying your skills in many of the sectors that are that are listed as priority sectors. So so far we have done um, nineteen activities, many with two or three sub activities, um, and in carried out in the U.S. and abroad. I think uh, following the examples that Sutherland mentioned, we have about eight or nine countries where we have partnered with universities from those countries in Mali, Zimbabwe, Mozambique. Um, Kenya, uh, we're going to start another partnership with four universities in Africa for uh, an early childhood education project that we manage as well. So there's there's a lot of opportunities to partner uh, for the implementation or to partner when you are planning the work. And that's one of the things that I always encourage researchers to when they want to submit a proposal. is like the first thing is just submitting it um, because what we try to do is if, even if you don't have the, the whole plan done at the time that you submit your proposal, we can help. Like it, this, is, this is a partnership, this is a consortium. We will ask our partners if they have contacts. We will ask our network members if they have contacts. So at the end of the day, it's not that you will be alone implementing, but if you have the basic technical skills that are needed, we will definitely be happy to receive your proposal. So don't be discouraged. Maybe some projects might seem a little bit uh, too ambitious, but um, yeah, just talk to us. And I think if, if you have those skills, um, that could be an opportunity for you. So the key is, is the flexibility to, to quick turnaround time and, and just um, like showing yourself and, and sending your, your comments, sorry, your proposals. Um, Actually, nice. to expand on yes. that, Gabriela, um, <clears throat> also this, this process is also an opportunity for an individual bidder to mm -hmm. his or her team his or, or her own team, whether that's within your university or across your colleagues that you may have worked with in other universities. So we're totally open to having the bidders themselves um, come up with a team that they want to come up with uh, for consideration. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Sutherland. So I think this is our last slide. So Sutherland, you want to talk about our website? Or we'll talk about our website. Um, yeah, the website has two main functions. As Gabriella mentioned, there's an internal members only portal where we share information about the opportunities. Um, there's a series of capacity building resources and webinars um, that we have developed over the past year or so. And these are generally led by our um, university or technical partners on specific areas broadly within development. Um, so that's sort of a way that we we see as uh, to both build capacity within the, the cadre of researchers we have, as well as an incentive to you know hear a good presentation about an interesting and topical topic, and to be able to uh, to find like-minded people um, within participation in those presentations. The external-facing website is um, largely a repository of the technical work that we do, whether those are conference papers, research studies, um, thematic things, blog posts, uh, and links back to some of USAID's broader priorities. So if you want to see in more detail, this is all again, you know, as a publicly funded agency, USAID has uh, an interest uh, to make the research that it produces public. So if there's a particular topic you're interested in, you are totally able to download what we've produced, um, follow up with the authors, um, you know, do with it what you what you may want to do. So at the very least, I encourage you all to take a look at the website. <clears throat> Certainly encourage you to register if you want to join the network and participate. But there's some interesting things on there that uh, I think you will find that also provides a window, to, a window into <clears throat> How does USA think about development 
what does uh, a final product look like? Um, what are the types of you know, the types of things that are on there in a level of detail will give you a sense of the types of interventions USAID is interested in uh, funding. So I think what to do now is say thank you and join us. I think, and then we can uh, field whatever questions you may have. And I believe there's one Gabriel on the chat you may want to look at. Uh -huh. So the question is, is it helpful to propose project with an existing partner or do we prefer too much partners? Um, no, how it works is in, in principle, when, when we release an opportunity to our network members, uh, you assemble your proposal on your own. Evidently, our, net, our partners may be interested in, in submitting a proposal for that activity as well. And as Oderland mentioned, uh, the University of Notre Dame has been successful in, in, in bidding and winning two or three different research opportunities. Um, so it's not necessarily that they will partner. We do facilitate the partnerships. Uh, when we release an opportunity, we ask people if they're interested and they don't have a partner um, or they don't have like, let's say there's, they, they can work indivi individually and they don't consider partnering with other people in their institution to, to report that to us so we can potentially connect people from different institutions. And we, we have had that situation a couple of times and we have uh, matched these researchers with interest in an activity and they have submitted a proposal. So this is feasible. It takes a little bit longer because depending on the time that people respond to us and express their interest with the short timelines that we have, um, that's a little bit of a challenge. So that's why we encourage people to be very like checking their emails and being reactive to that uh, because time matters for, for proposal development. And if, for example, you you submitted as an institution and, and we think that you may still be missing some something in your team, we could suggest other people uh, to complement your skills. Uh, very often could be NORC staff that uh, we can reach out easily and, and ask to, to join and support an activity, but it can be also uh, staff from our partners. For example, we have an, an activity now that will focus on industrial water treatment uh, for in pharmaceutical wastewater. Um, we don't have that expertise at NORC, so one of our partners is uh, linking us with their specialists to support this other team that won the, the activity to, to provide technical support as well on that. So. The possibilities are there. Um, as I said, I think the key is just to show yourself and say, well, I'm interested. How, how can we work together? Yeah, and on that point, it's, it's actually interesting. One of the things I find interesting about this project, and again, this is fairly innovative for USA to have a direct focus with academics are the, um, you know, are the main implementers of technical assistance. The mechanism for us, uh, and to some extent our sister project LASER that Decorah mentioned, is also a chance for USAID to figure out where does this expertise lie. Gabrielle mentioned some of the, in one of the slides, some of the um, things we've been asked to look at beyond the traditional USAID sectors, so machine learning, COVID-19 models. Uh, we also do some internal uh, work um, sort of institutional development management strategy work for USAID itself. So I encourage your, your, your business administration faculty to take a look as well. Um, and not, not think, you know, that we're only doing things within the nine sectors that we referenced, because we do, things do fall out of that um, as well. But it's interesting, yeah, I think USAID appreciates the facts to figure out from the academic, academic community to communicate to the agency itself where do these networks of expertise uh, and institutional pockets of expertise lie in the U.S. and abroad? That's a, a great point. And one, I just have a, a sort of follow on to that. I guess one of the questions that I have, there's sort of two pieces to this. One is in terms of like as a topic or as a proposal comes forth, one of the things that really seems important 
in all of the comments and sort of the process is involving the right stakeholders at the right time and having those sort of introductions and or having that sort of in place. So, you know, as a researcher, I and I, I think this will be true for my colleagues who are either here or who, you know, uh, view this after. One of the challenges might be like you might not necessarily have entree or know the stakeholders or who you should be talking to at that very formative initial development, you know, like phase. So you're trying to, it's almost like a chicken and egg question, right? You want to know like, well, I, I think I have something to offer to bring to bear on this topic, but I don't want to be so presumptive as to assume I, I know that, but you need to have at least enough of that to make a proposal co coherent and viable. So I guess one of the questions I have is, is, is somewhat pragmatic, like how, how are those voices of the community of the stakeholders, how does that sort of get filtered in into the proposal development process? Because I think for a lot of people who are thinking about how they might be responsive, that might be sort of a, a difficult bridge to cross, at least initially. Yeah, most of the, the teams, uh, the US-based teams that implemented an activity is where they did have a local partner. So they, and, and the local partner was not necessarily a, uh, an academic institution. Often it was an, an academic, but they also had access to consultants or like an NGO. I mean, it, it differed by, by projects. The one uh, about refugee resilience in Kenya, uh, the person had a very good network of, of community persons in um, refugee camps. So that was his field team practically. Um, so it, if most of the US-based institutions do have a partner or can access a partner, but um, as in, in this case, like at the, at the end, like RTAC delivers, as I mentioned, we will look for the partner, we will look for the contact. So if we see that we receive an activity where we haven't worked and, and we haven't um, that expertise from our network, we work during the time that you are working on a proposal, we're also making contact there. So by the time that the proposals are received, we do have some supporting materials, let's say, uh, to offer whoever is selected to, to complement the efforts because we know that, I mean, in two week time, it's very difficult to assemble such a, such a team and, and as you mentioned, reach that granularity. So we do have some work in our side to help implementers um, bridge that gap. And also, um, particularly when the activities are, are requested by the USAID missions, they will give you a lot of information. They will refer you to people, um, uh, important partners in the field, so you will have access also to their resources. Yeah, I was going to say that last point I think is important. From USAID's side, um, you know, they want, they want whatever activity that they're funding to be successful. So, um, you know, they will help us and help whoever uh, is implementing it as much as they can with what information they need. And generally, as Gabrielle mentioned, it's, you know, what background research has led up to this next stage and what the USA is trying to do. And uh, yeah, particularly where there's a mission, they have very good contacts, both, you know, foreign service officers um, and foreign service nationals who have a good sense of the stakeholder landscape. So in a proposal, you know, I think generally, you would note that you would want this type of stakeholder engagement to guide, you know, uh, the early stages of that, and, and then that's sort of a joint responsibility. Great, that's super helpful because I think that you know, again, that's one of those you know things that we know is important in terms of how and where you involve the stakeholders and community members. But in terms of like the, the implementation, these it seems like they kind of go in parallel to some degree at that sort, especially at the early stages. One one question that I'm seeing come through, it's it's filtering through it, it that I think is a, is one that that is important and probably on a lot of people's mind. But in the change in uh, administration, are there some sort of priorities that will be, you know, um, revisited, or, or what do you see as sort of the the agency's uh, priority set and how that'll sort of affect work in this in this space in the you know coming months and years. Sutherland, you're on mute. 
Sorry. Yeah, I think the answer is yes, but it's preliminary and unofficial. Um, based on um, the you know, uh, proposed administrator's background, I think you can anticipate certain areas of interest um, from her personal experience. But you know, the, this administrator, uh, you know, having been ambassador at the UN, has a broad range of issues. Um, I think you can look, I mean, if you, you can divine certain things if you read her public um, testimony um, from the Senate hearings, but um, not everything is just about her personally. It's, you know, it's a, it's a my administration priorities and things like that. Um, and how they rule things out uh, is, is also part of it. So I think in the coming weeks, you will be able to see more of that and it'll be more official and more focused, um, but and, yeah, until you get somebody in place who gives, you know, the first big policy speech, it's um, you know a mix of educated guessing and outright conjecture. So, and you should have asked a core that. <laughs> I was going to say, uh, you know, I guess maybe not better late than never, you know, because, it, but, but I do think it, it, you know, that's one of the things that sort of the, you know, trying to sort of finesse between reading the tea leaves and also trying to anticipate, like, as you're marshalling teams and ideas and resources and, and stuff to be able to be responsive, having a, a sense of that is, is helpful. And especially for people who are new to engaging, right? Because that, that is a tight time frame under any circumstances and when you're working in a university system, those gears grind sometimes quite slowly in terms of how quick things even have to move through different research offices. And they're like, we want to see the thing, you know, a month before it needs to be submitted. And then, you know, it, it, well, look, if you have two weeks, you have to, you have to, you know, do a different kind of, um, you know, uh, you have, have to have a different speed of activity. You're moving more at the speed of business than academia. So, you know, I think there's a cultural aspect to that as well. Um, yeah, and I just want to add to that. Um, that's what I mentioned earlier also that the contractual part may take long. Uh, we have waited for months for a contract to be negotiated and approved by all parties, but uh, that doesn't mean that the proposal time got shorter. So it's, it's uh, we know that things can take long and, and we have experienced that with many of our subcontractors or like partners in several of the activities, but but the key is to respond. Uh, we will deal with these things depending on your institutional policies um, and USAID is aware of that. And, and just going back a little bit to the issue of priorities, um, um, I mean, just, just to add a little bit to, to what Sutherland mentioned, um, you know, at the country level, uh, USA does have like priority documents, like, I don't know if you know the country development strategy documents. So of course, USA operates in, in a large amount of countries and you don't know where the need for RTAC might come, but at least at the country level, they, they have some long-term um, documents that outline their strategy and the type of topics they favor. So if in, someone has time, let's say, to go through all the country development strategy documents, you could, you could hint to where and where, where an activity might be needed. Um, and there's a lot of interest. We have several of our activities uh, relate to the humanitarian space. So also like what's happening in the world may give good hints for the type of things that might be needed. Another, yeah, another hint again, this is not, this takes some research, but um, I think under this administration, you'll see USA be much more closely aligned with State Department priorities. So the State Department under Blinken has already issued some policy, broad policy priority statements. And USA as the um, agency that has funding to do some of these things on the ground should be pretty well aligned with the policies that have been articulated thus far, if it makes sense, in terms of the development intervention. One of the questions that we, we always ask about or, or, or think about in, in, you know, sort of bringing the opportunities for academic involvement is how and, and in what 
capacities have you seen students get involved, you know, either graduate or, or, or undergraduate students at the university level? So kind of representing the, the universities in this, what are the ways that that's materialized? Is it through assistantships primarily or other mechanisms? Uh, how have you seen that play out? In the, in the activities that we have had uh, that require, let's say that they're more complex, they play the role of research assistants, either in the field through that data collection or analysis uh, in the US. So there's, there's and, and as I mentioned, many of the activities that we have are, they're quick, they are um, complex. So there's a good need of, of additional hands that can perform very discrete tasks uh, with good guidance. So many of our researchers have relied on, on students to support some of the activities. Yeah, and again, you know, that's totally up to the, the bidding team. So <clears throat> some of the teams that have bid are sort of part of, you know, the International Institute of University X. So they have grad students who are attached to that institute and we'll swap them in um, as they need. Yeah, so background research, writing, coordination of meetings, things like that. But yeah, definitely there's opportunity, there are opportunities for graduate researchers. Great, thank you. Are there other questions from the audience? I have one that I've been thinking about as well that I wanted to plant as we wait for you know some others to, to come in. But one is you know just thinking about you know some of the more successful examples of of this engagement and collaboration. Like, are there particular examples that really stand out? I mean, outside you name some in the presentation, but in terms of like really doing things particularly well, like what makes the most successful and effective projects and teams? You know makes them that effective, makes them that way? Are there some sort of key things, qualities, attributes, um, skill sets that, that really uh, you see as, as most critical uh, based on how well they do, have done? Um, if I can tell, it will be like being open and flexible. Um, because as, as the co-creation process starts and you start interacting with USA and learning more what they value, how they why they need a particular piece of information and what information is, is key for them. Of course, at the time that you, that team submit a proposal, they don't have this information. So, so to, to be able to, to receive this input and, and, and make adjustments as needed, of course, within the frame of the activity, uh, but to be able to understand the needs and make the adjustments, uh, that's what has left USAID uh, much more like satisfied with the end product because they could see that their questions were answered. I think also there's an element um, referencing something that Decora mentioned, universities um, and university consortia that have uh, a little more space for people to do research in their fields of expertise and the university's fields of interest that aren't only limited to getting a you know peer reviewed publication. Um, some of our university partners, you know, have the Global Institute of whatever or the Institute of Innovation, uh, and that's part of their incentive structures. Let's get our faculty, um, not necessarily just publishing, but out in the public space to do uh, a training, a webinar, uh, an, in, an an intervention where their field based research is funded by somebody. <clears throat> from that, they can publish whatever they want, but they're you know getting funded by the US USAID to conduct a, a you know a, a piece of research that has a more specific policy oriented outcome. Great, thank you. Thanks. I'll, I have a question too, and it's it's um, related to some of the things that you were saying in the presentation, um, and you know uh, new ad new administration coming in and so forth. So, is it possible to conjecture into the future of what kind of trends that you're seeing in terms of areas to be prioritized, uh, particular kinds of partnerships or, or scopes of projects, any, anything that you can see by looking into the crystal ball of the future? Yeah, 
We would think in terms of partnerships, I'm not so sure. I would think there would be, and USA has always had a strong emphasis on trying to engage local partners, institutions, both for to take advantage of local knowledge as well as to build capacity in local institutions. I think that would be a continued trend under partnerships. Also, I think it will see more of a shift to, uh, you know, democracy and governments type issues, development as, uh, you know, a, elevating development as a partner to the military and to the diplomatic corps. Um, I think those will be sort of broad themes that we'll see. Um, but also USAID is, you know, some of the things that they've funded also are responding to, um, you know, other global emerging trends, issues, I wouldn't necessarily say threats, but so work on public health on COVID related issues, COVID in relation to food security, artificial intelligence as it relates to education, uh, and ethics and privacy issues, things like that. Um, but yeah, I, I wish I could give you a more definitive answer. But when we talk in the fall, I think you'll know. All right, and that's very helpful. Thank you. There's a question that Chad Geber, I think you can field that one. Yes, so it's about uh, opportunities for international students. Uh, uh, I would say international students have the same opportunities that any other student, as long as you are registered at your university. So let's say if you for if you want to submit a proposal, of course, that's a, I mean, you need to work with, with uh, depends on like if you're a postdoc or if you're just a graduate student or an undergrad, that will be a little bit harder. So definitely you will need to partner with faculty. But you have opportunities, like if, if you are in a department and a professor there wants to submit a proposal and call you into the, into the team, um, you're welcome to join the activity. There's nothing that will prevent an international student to participate. Are there other questions that, uh, that others may have? Gabriella in Sutherland, I have a question. Um, I was wondering if you ever do um, info sessions or workshops where you, you know, bring university um, researchers to the table to sort of discuss ideas and workshop ideas um, and see if there's a potential for collaboration and, and working on a project together. I think probably not in the way you're thinking about it. Um... We have, though, in the past, you now as a typical USA project, there's an annual work planning process. Um, so in the past couple of years, we've solicited ideas from our partners, um, our, our fixed consortium partners, on things that they think may be of interest to USAID in the form of a policy conference, um, uh, a webinar for research network members, things like that and ask them to engage more broadly in their, um, you know, within their existing networks. But in terms of doing a, a more global beyond the consortium outreach thing, um, we haven't really, we've done a few sort of outreach presentations akin to what we're doing today um, for various groups, but um, that's a little bit beyond, I think, our, um, our scope to, to do that. Gabriela, do you have any observations on that? And yeah, no, I will just say that it's very difficult. As we mentioned, I mean, we, we don't know what we're working on until we receive a scope of work. So the, the mechanism is designed to be very reactive to the USA headquarters or mission needs. Um, we, uh, when we were, when COVID was just started, many people in our network were very eager to work on, on COVID related issues, uh, but. USA didn't make any request for COVID related issues. It, it, may, it, it came and we do have an activity, but it was way later, later and in, a, in frame in a different way than what our partners uh, were initially proposing. So like, let's say it, it's a one way road if you want to see the, the topics and the proposed, the, the, yeah, the scopes come to us, but we don't have that space to, to re suggest uh, research to, to USA. Well, thank you for that answer. That that 
is very um, helpful. And we certainly understand that you have a you know, quick turnaround time and you have to be very responsive. Um, so um, I think we should do just one last call for questions. Are there any other questions from the audience? I'm not seeing any more come in right now. So I, I think you know, we've certainly covered a lot of ground and I think really uh, an incredibly helpful and informative and valuable session. Um, I, I do think that we'll ultimately get some really good engagement, people signing up and, and, and kind of exploring opportunities and thinking more specifically about, you know, how to put uh, teams together um, and how to, you know, sort of be more active and be involved in this space. I think for a lot of our faculty and colleagues, they've really been, you know, doing the kind of work that could apply here and that could be relevant here. It's just a matter of thinking about how, how do you take that step? And this has been, you know, invaluable in, in I think, providing guidance there. So we will um, be glad to, to continue this uh, conversation. Um, want to thank you all, um, you know, uh, send a, a thanks to Takora. I know she had to leave earlier, but Gabriella and Sutherland, I think uh, your, your time with us today here in the symposium has been so appreciated. Um, and so thank you so much for, for, for being here. Uh, thanks for those who are able to join uh, in, in real time here with us today. Uh, we really appreciate your engagement and involvement. Um, we'll make sure the session is available on our YouTube uh, channel, uh, the recording of this, so that we can really uh, share it with more of our colleagues and, and the researchers as part of our consortium. Um, and again, thanks to, to Anna. Uh, thank you so much, Diana, uh, for organizing and putting this together, and Shebnam as well, uh, our, our team here. Uh, has really, uh, I think, done a great job with this symposium. And, and so it's always an honor and, and we uh, invite you, we will invite you back for our, our uh, November for our fall uh, symposium, because I think uh, this is, we're just really getting things going. Thank you again so much. We really appreciate it. Well, we appreciate the opportunity. Thank you. Stay in touch. Absolutely. All right, take care everybody.